being here. We appreciate it as always. And uh, we've got a um, good agenda. But uh, Julia, if you could do roll call, that'd be great. Yeah. So I'd like to remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded. And we ask that you please rename your Zoom name to your full name and the organization you're with. And if you're a resident, you can put the letter R. And when I call in your name, if you can please unmute and say which organization you're with. And then at the end, I'll be introducing a, the port of Stockton that's on the call. Okay, so first up, we have Rachel. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel. Uh, I am an air pollution specialist with the California Air Resources Board. Hi, Rachel. Thank you. And then we have Hector. Hey, Hector Olivares, uh, the program manager for the Environmental Justice Program, Catholic Charities of Stockton. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And then Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Lizzie Malgoza, and I'm also an air pollution specialist at CARB. Thanks for being here, Lizzie. Mm -hmm. And then um, Gloria. Hello, everyone. My name is Gloria Stefani Alonso Cruz, and I am representing environmental justice advocacy efforts with Little Manila Rising. Thank you. Kyle. Hey, afternoon, everybody. Wow, we got a bunch of CARB folks here today. Uh, yeah, I'm Kyle Goff. I'm a CARB with the uh, Office of Community Air Protection. Thank you. Welcome. And Margot. Hi, yeah, I'm Margot Prouse. Um, I sit on the AB 617 uh, steering committee for uh, Southwest Stockton as a resident. And I'm chair of our local Sierra group, which is why Jeff and I were talking because we, we hosted a coastal cleanup site as well. Thanks, Thank Margot. Thanks. And Mark. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Rasmussen. I'm the compliance manager uh, for the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. Thank you. Matthew. Hi everyone, Matthew Hansen with uh, the US EPA, uh, work on mobile source and uh, climate grants. Thanks for letting me be here. Thank you. And Jared, or we have Nate Knott. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm also on the AB 617 steering committee, have been on that since April 2020. And I'm also with the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water, Cafe Coop, and represent the Stockton Downtown Comeback Club. Thanks, Nate. And then we've got um, ASL interpreters Jerry and Carita on the call. Thank you for being here. And with the Port of Stockton, we have Commissioner Atwater, Port Director Kirk de Jesus, a Deputy Port Director of Regulatory and Public Affairs, Jeff Wingfield, a Jason Cashman, Environmental and Regulatory Affairs Manager. We have Daniel Orozco, Grants Management Specialist. And we have Victoria Lucero, Public Affairs Coordinator, Karen Romero, and myself. And I think I may have missed one person, um, Tanisha. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tanisha and I'm uh, with Catholic Charities. Thanks, Tanisha. Okay, I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Great. Well, thank you everybody again for being here. Um, we've got a, a good agenda. We're gonna change things up a little bit today. One of the things we're gonna do is have CARB give us an update on the at birth regulation, which is to, um, curb pollution from uh, ships uh, at the port and kind of what that looks like for the uh, the upcoming few years. And Lizzie's gonna give us an update there. And then we're gonna kind of um, also turn to some of the, the EJ groups as well and some of the members of this committee to kind of give updates of kind of some of the spotlights of what they're doing within their organization, um, as well as to provide um, basic feedback and information about what you would like to see out of this group, as well as um, just your um, expectations of kind of, uh, of the port as well. So um, we're gonna start every every month, we'll go around and have a different group speak. Um, this we, this this month, we're gonna have the uh, Environmental Justice um, Coalition for Water and SB is gonna give a presentation and um, speak, but we'll be reaching out to the other groups as well as we, as we move things along. So, um, I did just want to give a few brief port updates. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we were a site captain for coastal cleanup. We had pretty good turnout. We had um, 
Uh, some of our commissioners attended, the port director, tenants uh, included Newstar and BWC. Um, we collected uh, two 20 and 40 yard bins full of, of debris that were out on the south side of the port, not on port property, but uh, along Burns Cutoff, which is the, the waterway that kind of borders the um, southern boundary of, of the port's west complex. And it's typically an area that, that does get a lot of, of dumping. We have tried to put up signs out there saying you're being recorded, um, but that doesn't seem to curb a lot of the, the folks. Um, so uh, the more we, we tend to, to patrol out there, our port police is up on the, um, the back boundary there and, and does try to patrol as much as possible. But a lot of times at night and things like that, people sneak in and, and, and dump stuff there. But we did get uh, several tons of debris um, away from the waterway and into dumpsters and off to the, the landfill, which was, which was good. Um, the, uh, we held a back to school clothing drive for, uh, that was our tenants, uh, as well as the port employees, um, for Washington elementary. Um, that was very well received. I want to say we, we've got at least a couple truckfuls of, of clothing and other supplies that school, that the, the teachers needed. Um, so just some basic supplies there that we were able to help support. Um, we've got an exciting event coming up. Uh, we're still in the planning stages and we hope it's going to happen here at the port. It may end up being too big. We may end up having to do it downtown, but there's a group planning a, uh, 2024 trucking with clean fuels conference. Um, so it'll really be, if we can't have it here or wherever we do have it, we'll end up really pushing that to our tenants and having them, it'll, part of that will be a, a kind of a ride and drive uh, opportunity for, for some of our tenants to, to try out zero emission trucks. Um, and, and as we continue to, to head in that direction. Uh, tomorrow night, we are hosting a hybrid CEQA public meeting for BWC terminals project. That is a MOTEMS dock um, to bring in renewable fuels uh, here at the port. BWC, you're probably familiar with them. They've been an active uh, tenant here at the port, um, very busy recently on the renewable diesel side, uh, as well as biodiesel. Um, so that will be tomorrow from five to seven at the port, or there is also a link that you can join uh, remotely uh, via Zoom as well. So if you don't have that, feel free to reach out into the chat and we'll, we'll provide that as well. Uh, jobs board, we have had some uh, good interest in the jobs board. And I again, ask folks here who are in the community to, to keep pushing folks to sign up for the jobs board. We're really trying to get um, the opportunity for South Stockton residents to apply for jobs here at the port. Um, and they can do that easily. They can go onto our website, um, sign up. Uh, a lot of our tenants are signed up now and they're reaching out and looking for people and, and uh, when they have jobs come available and we've made a few connections there. We're also doing a uh, tutorial for our tenants to teach them um, and make it as easy as possible for them to, to have access to good quality um, folks uh, from the South Stockton area. Um, really quickly uh, on the Green Marine front, Metro Stevedore, they are one of our three Stevedore companies here at the port. Uh, Metro Port Stevedore location in Stockton is now um, Green Marine certified. So we are very uh, happy about that. And we are um, pushing that opportunity out to other tenants. And if you're not aware, Green Marine is a program and, a, and an organization that comes out and looks at your entire operation, how you handle the cargo, uh, your best management practices around your facilities, um, stormwater impacts um, to really make sure and, and do they, they send somebody out a third party to come and verify kind of how you're handling things. And they do that on a regular basis. Every two years you have to be recertified. And so folks come out and they spend a few days out here um, going through all of the procedures and, and talking to the employees and um, watching some of the, 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 the tenants out here um, and, uh, and certifying them if they, if they meet all the, the key performance indicators. So that is exciting. Um, are there any questions on any of the updates or any questions on potential other port updates that I didn't hit on? 
Jeff, this is Marco. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just have a quick about the trucking with clean fuels conference. That's pretty exciting. Um, do you know if it'll be early in the year or later in the year at this point or? We no think clue. it's going to be in February. Um, it's still, the details are being worked out, but we think it's going to be in, in February. And it will be open to the community? Yes. Okay. Because um, the city of Stockton is currently working on an ordinance. This is for warehousing, but the discussion mm -hmm. about heavy duty trucks and clean trucks and all those things is an ongoing discussion with, I think, a lot of erroneous information out there. So, Oh, OK. Well, that'd be great. They can kind of see hands on. They'll be able to talk to the manufacturers. We're hoping to get at least, uh, you know, five to ten different truck uh, OEMs to come out. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be similar to the event we did with Nicola. Um, mm -hmm. When was that last year? Was that last year? Um, and Nicola and others will, will be in attendance. So yeah, I think that'll really be a good opportunity to kind of get hands on and, and actually drive these vehicles and, and make those connections. Okay, thank you. You bet. Okay, any other questions? All right, if not, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lizzie at CARB then to give us an update on um, kind of the at birth regulation, kind of see where, where things are and what uh, we can all expect. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Jeff, yeah, Jeff, before I forget, uh, you went too fat over, but I have, I have a question regarding the list that you just prescribed, a thing, the cleaning and all that stuff. Are you going to be able to um, post it on flyer? What, when are you, where are you going to advertise that? Yeah, the event, we'll push it out everywhere. We'll push it on social media. We'll put it on our website. Um, I will definitely be uh, making sure that everybody from the AB617 meetings, as well as the um, the Port Outreach Committee here, you'll be getting, you'll all be getting the information. We'll send and also, out the, I did, oh, we'll I'm sorry. Via email as well. Sorry. Okay. And what about as far as uh, accessibility goes? Are, are they be able to receive any instruction for people with people with disability were able to participate and how would that be uh, able to have a symbol of them to understand that it's, 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 it's compliant with their disability that's my with my concern yes it will be um, it will be made fully um, available to to anyone with with disabilities for sure it'll be a full public meeting so um, don't worry about that Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jeff. That's all I need to. That's all I like to say. Thank you for now. We'll we'll be sending out emails as well. Okay, I will turn it over to Lizzie for an update on the car about birth regulation. Thank you, Lizzie. Thanks, Jeff. Let me uh, share my screen here. Hmm. Let's see if this works. There we go. Trying to do the presentation slide. mode. Are you good seeing slide. the presentation? No, it's in slide. It, it needs to be. Um, there we go. Think, there Does you that go. work? Perfect. Yes. Okay. All righty. So hello, everyone. And thank you for having me here today to discuss carbs at birth regulation with your community. My name is Lizzie Malgoza, and I work in the Marine Strategy section um, at CARB. And today I'll be giving a brief overview of the at-birth regulation that was adopted back in 2020 and some updates since then. And also joining me on the call is Rachel Reagan, who introduced herself earlier, um, and she recently started working in our section. So first I'm gonna give a high-level overview of the at-birth regulation, what its requirements are, and then I'm going to discuss the updates made in implementing the regulation. I'm going to give an overview of the port and terminal plans that we received, what they are, why we re require them, and what those plans showed. And then I'm going to get a, a quick overview of the interim evaluation report that was published last year and its findings. And then lastly, we'll have some time at the end for uh, questions and answers. 
So first, I want to give a brief background on the at-birth regulation. So the regulation goes back to 2007 when CARB adopted the first regulation to reduce emissions that ships generate while idling at port. Um, the requirements of the existing regulation began in 2014 and applied to cruise, container, and reefer or refrigerated cargo ships that visited the larger ports in California. So as of 2020, the 2007 rule achieved an 80% reduction in harmful emissions from more than 13,000 vessel visits. Um, that's going back from 2014. So the 2007 regulation was very successful. So you might ask why we needed another regulation. Uh, the reality is that we need more emissions reduction in portside communities like yours. Um, so CARB's board adopted the 2020 at-birth regulation back in August of 2020, which requires that every vessel must control their auxiliary engine emissions when they're at birth by connecting to shore power or an alternative control strategy. Um, these reductions can occur through, um, like I mentioned, the shore power or CARB approved alternative emission control strategy. You may hear CARB, especially in our section, throw around the term CAKES. That's an acronym. Um, and alternative CAKES could include a capture and control system or something like alternative fuels. So the existing regulation did not include all the ports in California. So vessels visiting ports like Stockton and Richmond were not required to reduce emissions from ships at birth. The new regulation will result in a 90% reduction in pollution from additional 2,300 plus uh, vessels per year and adds new vessel types such as tankers and roll-off, roll-on vessels, um, which are also known as row rows or car carriers. Um, in addition, this regulation is technology forcing since there are currently no control technologies commercially available for auto carrier and tanker vessels. The new regulation will result in a 55% reduction in potential cancer risk for communities near the ports of LA, Long Beach, and Richmond. So the 2020 regulation requires every vessel to reduce emissions, whereas the previous regulation allowed for fleets to use a fleet average for compliance. Um, container, refrigerated cargo, and cruise ships were required to comply with the new regulation starting on January 1st of this year, and the auto carriers will need to comply by January 1st of 2025. And lastly, tankers visiting the ports of LA and Long Beach will have to comply by January 1st of 2025. And tanker terminals in Northern California, such as Stockton and Richmond, will have to comply by January 1st of 2027. And the reason why Northern California tanker terminals have the latest compliance date is because the infrastructure upgrades in the Northern California tanker terminals are expected to take longer than in Southern California due to some unique infrastructure and permitting processes that are present in Northern California. Aside from directly reducing emissions to comply with the at-birth regulation, there are a few alternative compliance pathways that are built into the regulation. These are um, vessel and terminal incident events or buys and ties as you'll hear them called at CARB. Um, the remediation fund, which is only usable in specific qualifying circumstances and innovative concepts. So these pathways can be utilized to create flexibility for regulated entities without sacrificing the emission reductions that we need to achieve for the public health goals of the regulation. And lastly, regulated entities could elect to control emissions at an equivalent or greater level than from plugging into shore power by applying for innovative concepts. Um, these applications were due in 2021 and CARB is currently um, evaluating these projects to ensure they meet all the requirements in the regulation. So um, this may be more of a lengthier discussion, but this is kind of where the meat and potatoes is as far as implementation updates to the reg. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few key areas, including the remediation fund, um, where we are with CAKE's approval, um, a tanker demonstration pilot project, innovative concepts, port and terminal plans, and the recent EPA authorization that CARB received on the at-birth regulation. So as previously mentioned, the remediation fund is for vessels, terminals, 
cakes and ports that have invested in shore power or other carb approved emission control strategies, but they cannot successfully control emissions from a vessel for various qualifying reasons, such as construction delays. Um, those eligible to pay into the fund will be contributing towards other projects in the portside communities to reduce emissions. Remediation fund administrators are being established now, and there have been five air districts that have applied to be administrators of the fund. Um, those include the Bay Area, San Joaquin Valley, Ventura, San Diego, and South Coast, and CAPCOA has also applied to be a administrator. Um, shore power and capture and control systems were the main compliance pathways used under the 2007 reg and are expected to continue to be the main control technology used for compliance with the new reg. Um, CARB has been working closely with providers to expand the availability of at-birth emissions control systems. Stax Maritime is building a barge-based capture and control system for use on tankers um, as part of a $10 million grant that, um, from CARB, and that system will be available by the end of 2024. So currently there's one CAKES um, that's been approved, has an approved executive order for container vessels. And there's five more, including uh, container, tanker, and railroad vessels that are in progress. Uh, the 2020 regulation includes a provision called the Innovative Concepts Compliance Option, which is a pathway that promotes early reductions and allows regulated entities to reduce emissions through other projects, as long as they can uh, prove those projects achieve equivalent or greater emission reductions in the same communities versus reducing emissions directly from vessels at birth. So CARB received 12 innovative concept applications um, outlining 63 different concepts. Um, almost half of the proposed innovative concept projects involved utilizing barge-based capture and control systems to bank emission reduction credits um, by reducing emissions from currently unregulated vessel categories um, like bulk vessels. Um, numerous applicants are also proposing to use innovative concepts uh, to achieve early emission reductions ahead of their vessel specific compliance date in order to bank emission reduction credits. Um, while these innovative concept projects have yet to finish going through CARB's evaluation project, um, they're still in work and those should be uh, being approved or, or not approved soon. And as far as the port and terminal plans, I'll go over that on the next slide. Um, some really good hot off the press news that I have to share with everybody is um, yesterday US EPA uh, in, put in a notice of decision, which granted authorization of the at birth regulation. So we applied for approval for authorization from EPA last year. And just yes, uh, yesterday they posted that notice of decision um, this hasn't been published in the Federal Register yet. It's going to take a few days or possibly weeks, but this is really important for us to enforce this regulation. Um, so we we're very happy about that. When, um, Douglas, I saw that your hand was up. Do you have a question? All right. It looks like you put it down. So. Okay. All righty. All so I wanted to discuss some details on the port and terminal plans that we received and their role in achieving compliance with the at birth reg. Um, so these plans outlined how each port and terminal, um, their pathway towards compliance and provided insights into their chosen compliance strategy. Um, these plans also provided details on the division of responsibilities between the terminal and the ports for enacting the infrastructure required by each terminal's plan. These plans were required to be submitted to CARB by December 1st of 2021. And CARB staff reviewed these plans. And if the ports and terminals did not receive an incomplete letter from CARB within 90 days after submittal, their plans were uh, considered complete. And the information in these plans was also used in our interim evaluation, which I'll discuss in more detail on the next slide. Um, the, more, the majority of the non-tanker port and terminal plans indicated their uh, they would comply um, by their respective compliance dates. Shore power was the primary compliance option for the non-tanker vessels. 
And some terminals also explored alternatives such as capture and control systems and also innovative concepts like hydrogen fuel cells. So for tanker terminals, the scenario varied. Many did not identify a clear compliance pathway or committed installation by their compliance date. For those that did, shore power, capture and control, and innovative concepts were the primary compliance options. So about 50% of Southern California tanker terminals anticipated meeting the 2025 compliance date, while approximately only 25% of the Northern California tanker terminals um, believe they can comply by 2027. So challenges in meeting compliance dates were primarily linked to technology readiness, safety considerations, um, extended construction uh, timelines, and also lengthy permitting processes. Um, while some terminal plans reference uh, feasibility studies, many of these plans lack specific installation schedules or site-specific evidence. And it's important to note that the regulation incorporates built-in flexibilities, including the remediation fund and innovative concepts that I discussed previously. Um, these are mechanisms provide support to terminals in the event of delays to ensure that the emission reductions for communities are still achieved. And you can find all the initial and revised terminal plans via the link on this slide. Um, Updated row, row row, so those auto carriers and taker terminal plans are due in 2024 for Southern California tanker terminals and row rows, and then in 2026 for Northern California tanker terminals. <clears throat> so next I'll be discussing the findings and recommendations from CARB's interim evaluation report on the at-birth reg, um, which was published December of 2022. And the primary purpose of the interim evaluation report was to provide CARB's board and the general public with an implementation status update for the at-birth reg. The report evaluated the progress made towards complying with the emission control requirements, examined the impacts of COVID on the shipping industry, and served as a tool to help guide potential fu uh, future CARB actions for reducing emissions from ocean-going vessels. Um, also including the feasibility of potential control requirements for bulk and general cargo vessels and vessels that anchor. So staff's first recommendation from that report is that no changes should be made to the app regulation at this time. That includes no changes to compliance dates and no inclusion of new vessel categories. Unlike the majority of non-tankers, tanker vessel and terminal operators have generally been more hesitant to commit to an emission control strategy and are less optimistic about the ability to meet the compliance deadline of 2025 and 2027. However, CARB is not recommending any adjustments to the compliance dates for tankers at this time, given the lack of specific information received by tanker operators and our need for health benefits to be gained from tanker vessels in general. Um, also, given the flexibilities built into the regulation that we've discussed on the previous slides, um, we see no reason for further compliance dates. So our second recommendation from that report that um, CARB's board should direct staff to pursue further pathways for re further reducing emissions from vessels. Um, this could include addressing emissions from vessels in transit, at anchor, and also maneuvering. And bulk and general cargo vessels will be part of the value evaluation as part of the new in-transit rule development. Uh, pursuing a future shipping measure is expected to reduce significantly more emissions, um, especially since uh, ocean-going vessels produce most of their emissions during transit. And the formal rule development is expected to, to begin uh, starting next year into 2025. And Jeff, um, do you have a question? I see your hand up. Yeah, just just a point, I think, for the group to understand if when we're talking about, um, you know, when, when Lizzie was talking about the, the terminals being kind of responsible for implementing this, um, you know, the way the port operates, the port of Stockton operates is a little bit different than a lot of the other ports. And so we don't have, quote, terminal operators. All of our berths are public berths. So I'm just trying to... Uh, let people know that so that burden will fall onto the port of Stockton 
um, and to try to figure out how we work it out. So um, that just just a little background for the group. That's really all I wanted to clarify. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. Okay, so this slide just kind of goes over, if you guys want more details about the regulation, um, you can use that website there. Um, my manager is Angela Chandis, her contact information is there, and then my email is also on this slide. Um, and that's pretty much it. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Margo, do you have your hand up? I, I do. Thanks for the presentation, um, Lizzie. I was wondering, so it's to me, if I heard it correctly, it sounds like the, the focus for the CARB regulations currently is um, tools for the port, infrastructure for the port to actually accommodate some changes. And the future would be focused on the vessels making changes. Um, well, even with the current regulation right now, the vessels have to make changes to their um, to in order to incorporate shore power onto their vessels. So, um, the the current regulation only looks at controlling emissions once those ships come into and you know right at port, right at the berth there. And so, so, so it's true for all the international ships and such and all those things. Anybody that, yeah, any ship that comes into California waters. Okay, thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I don't see any other hands. It'll be, um, yeah, so this this one will be challenging. We're trying to find funding actually right now and, and uh, develop our plan to figure out how we're gonna comply with this. I think I've mentioned to this group before that uh, the vessels that come to Stockton are not going to be able to plug into shore power. So our really only option is the um, capture and control system or the, the cake. So that's kind of where we are putting our focus on, on at this point. Gloria, do you have a question? Yes, I was just, um, I was just curious to understand how this impacts new projects who are expecting to build a terminal and um, depend on shipping or depend on having ocean going vessels to ship their pro their products overseas. Like, can you provide any insight on that? You mean as like how it impacts them financially? Um. Not necessarily financially, more concerned about the community's health in general and uh, how this will be reflected on the clean air plan in terms of like making sure that we're on the on the right path to to mitigate emissions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this regulation is going to have a, a large increase in emissions reductions, especially after the tankers are controlled. Um, tankers make up a big contribution of OGV emissions um, when you look at statewide anyways. So I think when you look at just diesel PM and NOx reductions, I think it's about a 55% reduction in the future once this regulation is at full implementation. So um, I know that Stockton gets bulk and, and tankers too, but Jeff, you could speak more too as far as, you know, percentage of tankers over bulk, but um, I think Stockton in general would see a, a, a pretty good, you know, reduction in air pollution from from that alone, from the tankers. And in the future, if folks controlled, then even more. So, yeah. Yeah, I will say just just as far as the, the cost for the capture and control system, I think we budgeted about $12 million for one system that could work at one berth and control emissions from ships that come in. Um, that's just the, the construction costs. Um, we are still trying to work out what the, um, the, the, the operating costs would be. And there's a bunch of variables there too, because we're still trying to figure out if we would do a barge-based system, which would be in the water and then be able to move from birth to birth, or whether it's a land-based system um, that's stationary 
uh, that then would just only be applied to, to one specific birth. Um, so those are all the things, Gloria, that we're trying to figure out. And then from there, we have to figure out, okay, how do those costs, where do those costs go? Obviously, they're going to be um, impacting um, uh, the, the ships that call at the port and the, the beneficial cargo owners. So, Kirk, I don't know if there's anything else that, uh, that you wanted to add on that. No, Jeff, I think you hit it. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, so those those are the things we're figuring out. And there's a couple ports that uh, down in Southern California, as Lizzie mentioned, they're they're two years ahead of us. So we're trying to um, take advantage of lessons learned from from the way they're setting some things up. So it's all kind of unfolding right now as you figure out how how um, we're going to implement everything and and distribute those costs uh, here at Stockton. Thank you for answering that. And just to further clarify this, just for my own learning, um, in simple terms, how would like uh, proposed projects need to think about this at birth regulation moving forward? Um, how would they need to like make sure they're incorporating this? Um, yeah. They're gonna just have to build that additional cost into their into their business plan. Um, and that's that's the short answer, Lizzie. You can go ahead. You're well, listening. I was going to ask what what her what her what she was meaning when she said proposed projects. Um, are you referring to like the terminal side or community side? Um, the terminal side, I guess. Um, and yeah, I guess to clarify this, just whenever the port enters an agreement with a with a a project, how would that be included? Um, does that clarify? Yeah, I think that helps. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the regulation was approved in 2020, but we'd been working on this regulation for some years prior to that. So it's it's not something that, um, you know, terminals are surprised by um, seeing that the regulation started this year. So like Jeff said, the, the, that cost will be passed down ultimately to the consumer, most likely. Um, but the ports and the terminals are going to have to bear that cost up front. Um, I'm trying to, uh, I had a thought there and I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> See if it comes back. But yeah, as we, do as, as we negotiate with, with future tenants and, and where terminal operators we're we're interchanging terminal operators with tenants here at the port because that's because there are no true terminal operators that that operate those berths as i said before that's the port of stockton um and so the tenants have to build that cost into um into their their uh, expenditures each year but they don't know they know it's they know the regulations there and we share with how we're going to comply with it um, but we don't have a fine number, uh, a defined number as, as to what that cost is going to be quite yet. We have general uh, ballpark, but um, it's still being determined. Yeah. Jeff, well, Jeff David Atwater, will the shippers, will, how much of the, that cost will the shippers have to absorb? Yeah, they're going to have to uh, uh, absorb the majority of it, if not all of it. Right, and that that will that will pass on to the consumers, and the shippers will then then they will do the evaluation of where they want to ship their products. Exactly, based on their cost of of uh, of loading and unloading vessels. Yes, and so one of the things that we, I mean, it it puts California to a little bit of a disadvantage on that that end. We're hoping, and we would love for there to be a level playing field throughout the the world, and we've even asked um, uh, some of the the the, the global agencies to, to kind of, you know, figure out if we can make this, you know, just a regular, um, uh, a regulation throughout, throughout the entire globe. And I think there's been a little bit of pushback on that, but that's something that like the association of Pacific, uh, uh, or association of American port authorities and, and, uh, others are trying to push so we can get a level playing field, uh, you know, across the globe. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there will there be cargo diversion potentially to a different state? I mean, that's always an option and an, and an opportunity. Um, we hope not. 
nor possibly to Western Mexico. That's that's another one. Correct. Canada. But yeah, and one thing I wanted to add, Gloria, too, is in the port and terminal plans that we required um, ports and terminals to submit, uh, we had them put in a division of responsibilities as far as like who's going to be responsible for infrastructure costs, right? Um, and so they had to outline and, and those plans can be updated um, at any time, but we wanted to get the ports and terminals talking to each other early on to, you know, who's going to bear this cost up front. Um, and I think that's one thing about this new regulation is previously the, the onus to comply was on the terminals and now it's equal. It's between the vessel, the terminal and the port. So um, there's multiple mechanisms in there where they have to, you know, have early communication to make sure those those ships are controlling their emissions. Thank you. Well, I thank appreciate you so that. much. You're yeah, welcome. thank you, Lizzie. We really appreciate it. And yeah. um, thanks for having me. Yeah, and if you guys have any questions in the future, feel free to um, shoot me an email or Angela. Thanks for having Very me. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on to our, our next presenter. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna have uh, the environmental justice groups um, give a brief presentation, just kind of a little bit about them, a little bit about what, what, uh, what they are, are doing um, and I'd invite anybody, uh, we'll, we'll select somebody else for the, for the next round, but we wanted to introduce and thank Espy Vielma, the executive director of the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water, for being the first and coming to speak with us tonight. So welcome, Espy, and thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and um, good evening. Again, my name is Esperanza Vielma, and everybody knows me as Espy, and um, I um, reside and I'm originally from the city of Stockton. So um, I went by way of city of Stockton to um, Delta College to UC Berkeley and I'm back home now. And I'm uh, the organization that I'm currently um, heading is the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. And it was founded in 2005. And we um, also just recently in the past couple of years co-founded the Coalition for Environmental Equity and Economics, CEEE, and um, where we work on clean energy with that component. So um, we basically have worked with community members, you know, for what is that, like 17 years, over 17 years throughout the state. We're a statewide organization. And um, so I do um, apologize. I am actually in Los Angeles right now because we're working on a campaign out here. Um, something I could talk about later on. We're at the Water Replenishment District here. Um, which is a great center. So maybe we can do something like that in Stockton. But um, basically in terms of going over like, you know, mission and vision, you know, we are committed to the environmental justice we, um, communities throughout the state of California. We um, help in terms of trying to advocate for those environmental justice issues and water policy, clean air and clean energy. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go into like the full detail as far as like, you know, mission statement, what have you. Um, I myself, like I said, I grew up in an environmental justice community in Southside Stockton, south of um, Charter Way, uh, off an of airport. So I understand firsthand what it is in terms of being, you know, environmental justice community member, um, not just from the perspective of being, um, you know, sometimes from the policy perspective or policy lens, because, um, you know, that is the community where I am from, and that is the community that we serve along with the other communities. And we work in collaboration with um, local stakeholders and with um, various agencies and other community-based organizations as well as, as, um, as larger um, uh, CBOs. And so um, the goal here in terms of what we're trying to accomplish is, um, let me see, if we go to the next slide, sorry. So some of the things that, you know, we've worked on in the past and um, that we've engaged with, and, and one of the things that I do want to point out is that, you know, 
many times the community-based organizations, you know, can state as far as commitment level to our environmental justice communities, but we do work and strive for making sure that um, we not only serve the community members, but we demonstrate, you know, that um, the data that is obtained and, you know, the real people that are behind that, that data. And uh, we work with different research institutions with uh, UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, UC Davis, and with the Universidad um, Nacional Autónoma de México, UNAM. Um, and as far as what some of the things that we've worked with, you know, most recently here in the in our in our region is under Proposition One, we created the first disadvantaged community task force for the Greater San Joaquin County Irwin region. And we did that as a subcontract to um, San Joaquin County, but in addition to that, we were also part of the San Joaquin River funding area, and we served the American River Basin. And this was during full blown COVID, so we were doing outreach to the community and 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 trying to obtain you know what were their needs at that time for um you know for for uh, drinking water and for stormwater wastewater we did that through both through the american river basin region as specifically in the environmental justice communities as well as in the greater san joaquin area in addition to that, during COVID, we also had the lovely task of working under the USDA uh, Rural Development Technical Assistance and Training Project that we had in 12 regions. So we worked in Sacramento Valley, Salinas Valley, and San Joaquin Valley. We conducted outreach throughout those communities and also in terms of trying to obtain what were their needs and you know how could they be better be served by the various agencies, um, state, county and local different um, water agencies. As part of that, we were part of the initial, what's now called safer drinking water, but it was the emergency drinking water grant that first started in Monterey County. And so doing the assessment needs based on contaminated wells in that area. And we also in this region worked on the get out the vaccine campaign that was part of UCLA and the governor's office in which um, we had between 40 and 100 canvassers implementing technical assistance with the My Turn app and helping our community members and to increase the saturation rate and, um, and complete that, that process through crowd canvassing, phone banking, and door to door. And all of this, if anyone's interested, <laughs> we have reports on. So um, I'd be more than happy to share those with um, Julia and then pass those along. Um, one of the things that uh, we also did that we want to implement, you know, very soon here in our county in Sacramento, we were able to do the Morrison Creek revitalization project with various partners as part of the Department of Water Resources Urban Streams Restoration Project. What we did there is that that is a... Um, it's an urban stream that um, runs through the southeast part of Sacramento. And so um, what we were trying to do there is to create a neighborhood spot for recreation, education, um, so that residents can go, um, go there and enjoy the actual creek itself. So as a result of all the partners, all of us working together along with the engineering firms, um, we set forth what currently the city of Sacramento now has, which is they received a grant for 697,000 through DWR to continue this revitalization of Morrison Creek. And they were able to, um, they're actually just, you know, continuing the, the community meetings to keep that going. So again, this is something that we're looking for future wise, you know, working here in this region as well. And, um, we always and continuously work with actually the Port of Stockton and it's really important these meetings that we're currently have because you know I we're able to learn what the port's doing, but we're also have been able to participate in a very effective manner to do the Delta waterway cleanups and this has been an ongoing project of which, you know, hopefully we'll be also collecting data, which I haven't talked to Jeff about yet, but um, we're working on a, on a statewide um, initiative with the, um, the Coastal Commission in which we're gonna be working with groups throughout the state of California. And so we're gonna look at 
um, the component that has to do with plastics in water specifically. So um, I'll give you all a little bit more information as we proceed forward with that. That's just something that's starting out. We're also working with the Mariposa Industrial Warehouse Project with the Sierra Club, um, some of the members who participate on these calls as well. And we are in the midst of working on the study of heat, COVID, and nutrition in the San Joaquin Valley farm workers. And that's in conjunction with um, UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, and UNAM. We also were conducting a, um, a study with UC Davis and the UC Davis Cancer Center that we're looking at the carcinogenic constituents of domestic wells in Northern and Central California. That's at the very um, beginning stages. Um, and with that being said, there are some interesting facts that we found out there that the um, cancer rates in certain types of cancer are higher in the 15 counties that the UC Davis Cancer Center serves. And um, so the counties that we're in, plus the, our surrounding counties, um, unfortunately, are part of those, um, those high numbers. And we also participate in the Stockton Mobility Collective as far as, you know, with the um, electric vehicles. And um, the, the last thing, and I think that's on my next slide that we're working on, is a statewide campaign. And that statewide campaign has to do with the fixed charge proposal by the, um, the IOUs, and that's being presented to the, um, the CPUC. And with that, that's part of the Coalition for Environmental Equity and Economics. And so with that component, what we're doing is um, trying to educate our community members and trying to let them know what's taking place and how it will affect them, basically like their bottom line, bottom dollar. Um, and with that being said, we've had some panels with different economists um, in order to inform the public as far as um, what that would, when it's enacted, um, because that's a bill, 205, then what would happen, you know, as far as every resident in California having to pay um, additional charges on their electric bill. So we're in the midst of that. That's all happening throughout the state of California. And again, I'd... Um, I can share, you know, the video that has to do with the um, with that particular um, statewide uh, campaign and informational campaign that we're conducting. So I'd be more than happy to like follow up with that and um, you know let folks know as we proceed and move forward with with that particular um, campaign that's that's that has to do with the economics, especially with our EJ community members. And, um, but those are just like some of the highlights of what we're working on. And, um, and like I said, I'll, I'll, I can follow up with additional information because it is quite a bit of information <laughs> and um, we're working on all those ca campaigns simultaneously and, um, and we can keep you, you all posted and I can send that by way of Jeff and, and Julia to share with the rest of our group. And again, thank you for the opportunity for allowing us to share some of the things that we're working on. <laughs> again, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, and, and, and she also sits on the IHUB board and just had me come out to speak at uh, one of their big annual events to uh, highlight, but you know, things we're doing on the electric uh, and zero emission front uh, here at the port, which was a great opportunity. And I thank you for that. And through that, we've been able to make a lot of other connections and. Uh, be able to share other information with with business leaders um, throughout the the area. Um, were there any questions for for Espy? Okay. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here and sharing that. Um, it's really important. I think that that as much as you hear from us, that that we hear from you too. What your priorities are and um, you know things that you guys are working on. So. Um, Thank you. If, if there, I'll be happy to take any other questions before we wrap up, but we're just at five o'clock and uh, want to be respectful of people's time. So if there are no other questions, oh, Matthew. Uh, would it be okay if I, I made a quick announcement? Absolutely. Okay, I'll come on camera. Or, um, actually, uh, Margo, I'll let Margo go for us. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to thank Espy. Uh, she actually makes me tired just hearing what they're all working on. It's a little overwhelming, but it's pretty exciting. 
And Jeff, I want to say that, as I mentioned, the city of Stockton is looking at an ordinance for the warehousing to monitor, uh, to deal with heavy duty trucks. And the Port of Stockton was recognized by one of the planning commissioners as being a, a, um, a star in what they're doing with their electrification of the port. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, I will say that also SB is just, she is a star as when it comes to definitely our, um, our, our waterway cleanups, because she brings out, a, you know, whether it's drone operators or uh, a bunch of people, they're always out there so eager and willing to help with great attitudes. And we really also appreciate um, that. And I don't think I mentioned that at the beginning of our meeting. So thank you, SB, for always bringing out and having willing and helpful participants. Okay, Matthew, did, did you get, uh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And thanks everyone for giving me the space. Um, I do want to announce that um, our, that the, there's going to be a new funding um, webinar coming up to that will highlight um, an EPA uh, clean ports program. Um, and that is going to be on October 31st. And, uh, you know, I'll put some more information in the chat uh, after I, I speak, but um, so the Clean Ports Program is a $3 billion um, pot of money um, uh, funded through the Inflation Reduction Act. And it's really meant to fund zero emission ports equipment and technologies. And then there's also a, a little pot of money as well to um, help uh, fund dev and develop uh, clean uh, clean action plans for at ports. Um, so on the 31st, we're going to do our first unveiling of kind of the, you know, eligible activities, L, um, you know, the uh, ill value, yeah, evaluation criteria and kind of the program structure. So I I'm going to put some of those links um, in the chat in a moment. And then and uh, if anyone has questions, you feel free to email me as well. No, thank you so much. We've been we've been waiting for this funding. We've heard so much about it, and you know we we thought it was going to funnel through EPA at some point. So we're really excited that uh, that we're we're almost to that point. So um, looking forward to seeing the information, and we'll definitely be uh, involved in the webinar on the thirty first. So okay. On that great note. I think we can call it a night and thank everybody again for being here. And we will uh, see you next week. As always, if you're interested in a tour, um, Gloria, I reached out to you specifically in the chat because I did, I wasn't sure if uh, you had been on a tour yet. And I also think that um, just coming out and seeing some of the, the things and seeing how the ports laid out and seeing what we're doing is always beneficial. So I'm always wanting to put that out there. If you haven't been on a tour, please reach out and we're happy to schedule something. And hi, Mary Elizabeth. I didn't see you joined. Hello. I came late. I've got a different uh, schedule at work. Thanks. No worries. Bye. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you everybody. Appreciate thank you. you. Have a great evening. Thank, thank you. Bye. Yeah.